Welcome to Unit 21 video where we're going to talk about gases, liquids, and solids, our three primary states of matter, and their, their transitions, and also some of their characteristics a little bit, and see what happens in there. So, we look at, this is really sections 6.1 and 6.2, and uh, 6.1 will be dealing with identification of molecular level differences, what's the difference between this type of compound and that type of compound. We'll talk about terminology of phase transitions, actually between solids, liquids, and gases. We'll talk about uh, phase transitions, that's going from melting, boiling, things you're familiar with, phase diagrams, something called supercritical fluids, we'll look a little bit at comparison of ionic and molecular compounds leading up to the next unit, which we'll talk a little bit more about what makes something behave the way it does. And so you ought to probably take a look and read section 6.1 6.2 before you view this video. <coughs> So, in talking about identifying the molecular level difference, what we're really talking about is we have our three states, gases, liquids, and solids. Plasmas are there too, we don't really worry about those, we'll just worry about the ones we can handle uh, more directly. Gases, liquids, and solids, and the idea that we have is that in gases, that the particles, whether they be molecules, atoms, whatever they are, are going to be very far apart, and they're moving very rapidly and very randomly in their container, whatever that container is. Liquids have particles that are fairly close together, but they can still move past each other, but it's relatively slowly compared to a gas. And these are very close compared to what a gas molecules would be, that gas particles. And solids have particles that are fairly fixed in position, but can vibrate about that point, and so they aren't flowing like uh, in the case of liquids are. We're going to take a look at a, at a FET simulation here and kind of get an idea as to what happens as we take we heat and cool sorts of things in terms of particles and see what happens from there. Let's go ahead first and take a look at some of the simulation questions we're going to look at. We're going to look at what happens when we change temperature. What happens to the atoms when we change the temperature of something and kind of see how things convert from one, one part to another. And <clears throat> we'll kind of heat it up, we'll cool it down, we'll do things of that nature. So let's slide over to that um, simulation right here. And what you'll see in here is I've got down here a bunch of, these are particles, these could be, well it says it's neon up here. So these are neon atoms stuck inside here. It could be water, it could be anything here. If I have neon atoms in here, neon's a noble gas. He's, helium's the lightest noble gas, neon's the next lightest noble gas. You notice the temperature here is at 13 Kelvin. If you go back to temperature scale a little bit, we haven't done a whole lot with it. We'll do more in gas laws, but we haven't done a lot with it. But the Kelvin scale is the absolute scale. So zero Kelvin is the absolute zero of the universe. Thirteen Kelvin is something like negative three hundred or negative four hundred degrees Celsius, which is probably like negative eight hundred degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere in that vicinity. So you kind of have to think about how cold that is. And so neon here, you notice that the, the atoms of the neon are just kind of hovering around each other. They aren't really moving very much. They're vibrating about a single point. That's the classic characteristics of a solid. So neon's a solid at this 13 Kelvin. Now if I take and I think about what a liquid looks like, liquid, when I click on here, you'll see now that now the atoms are moving around. If you take and you do a, I was going to step, 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 can't do that. Oh, if I do this, if I do step, 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 I do this each one of the steps which you'll see, pick out an atom, look at an atom like uh, this guy right here and as I step through here oh, lose my cursor when I do that these guys are just kind of flowing by each other a little bit, this is a classic liquid state and what's the gas going to look like? the gas is going to look like this and if we just let it play, these guys are moving all over, they're going very rapidly, keep bumping into each other lots and lots of them in that in that space and they're very very far away from each other so we have those kind of three classic cases we're looking at now let's go back and let's put it back in a solid form let's see what happens when I start to heat this stuff up if I start to heat it up we'll put the flame up here like this and if you watch the thermometer up here uh, I can't be in two places at once it looks like a the thermometer is going 32 Kelvin and what you notice happening here is these neon atoms that we had are starting to actually move around more like liquidy, aren't they? And some are escaping into vapor phase, and that's only like 36 Kelvin, somewhere in there. So as I take it and heat these guys up, they move faster. Their, their, their movement overcomes their force of attraction to each other, and they just kind of fly all over the place. So that's, that's neon. If I take it and I switch over to water, for example, let's look at water. If I go to water now, so here we are at, well, let's cool it way down. That's 328 Kelvin. I'm going to put the ice cubes up there. Everybody knows that ice cubes will cool that bucket in a hurry. 
So we'll take them down here and look something like this. And so here's water at 116 Kelvin. That's about that's a negative few hundred or something. I don't really want my webcam recording. Um, <clears throat> these guys in here are pretty much in solid form. Water has this interesting little structure. Notice it's a red ball and two white ones. That's a an oxygen atom and two hydrogens attached to it. These are all water molecules in here. What you know for this, for sure, is that if I take and I heat this up like this, that temperature is going to go up. 195, 213, 266, still solid. Heat up a little bit more. And now what do you see? This is starting to look more like a liquid, isn't it? Okay, so they start vibrating around, vibrating, doing that sort of thing. And if I take and heat them up a little bit more, water boils at 100 Kelvin, at 100 Celsius. And so if I go to Kelvin, that'll be 373 Kelvin. So when I get to 373 Kelvin, here I am above, through and I start throwing off water molecules. So you can see what happens as you heat it up. The molecules move faster and faster. If they aren't held together very well, they're going to go into the gas phase. Okay, so that's just kind of a, a visual of that. So let's take a look now at... Here. Now, what do we notice about the atoms as the temperature increases? I think you might be able to see that they actually move faster, don't they? And if I cool them, of course, obviously they move slower, more slowly. And so, what's happening during these processes is melting. Melting is where you're going to go from a conversion of a solid to liquid. <clears throat> you're familiar with that. Ice cubes melting. That's exactly what you're looking at. Uh, it's going to happen when you heat the solid. Vaporization is where you convert a liquid into a vapor. So, you heat the liquid up. Put a pot on the stove, boil it, and pot of water on the stove, boil it on the stove. It's going to vapor, evaporate on you. Condensation is the opposite of that. It's going to take the vapor, and when you cool it down, it's going to turn it into liquid. And then freezing is where you're going to take the liquid into a solid. So these are really kind of opposites of each other, freezing and melting, condensation and vaporization. But they're focused around the same transition. Solid liquid, liquid gas. And then there's one called sublimation. And sublimation that's where a solid directly goes to vapor. Do you know what the most famous sublimator probably is? It's probably dry ice. Dry ice goes straight from being a solid into being a vapor and doesn't leave anything behind in that process. So <clears throat> let's look at these transition temperatures just a little bit to get an idea of what goes on in these different phases. So if I ask you the boiling point of water, you're going to come up and say it's 100 degrees C or it's 212 degrees Fahrenheit, one of those well-known numbers. But the fact is that that's only under a certain set of conditions that water has that boiling point. I can actually boil water at room temperature if I just take and pull a vacuum on it. It'll look like it's boiling. You don't want to touch the flask because you're going to go, wow, it's hot. It's bubbling, bubbling, bubbling. It's actually cold when it's doing that, but it's still boiling. And so the difference, so we need to look a little bit at what the idea of boiling is and freezing and melting and that kind of thing. Well, let's look at boiling point because it's easiest to picture. First point, some water molecules are always escaping in the vapor state and some are always condensing back into liquid state. It's always going both directions. The second point, when the rate of escape equals the rate of condensation, okay, the system is said to be at equilibrium. So if I have 10 molecules per minute going up and 10 molecules per minute coming down, that's a, we say that's at equilibrium. And what that means is I'm not going to be changing the amount of liquid or the amount of vapor I have because I'm replenishing it all the time. Okay, so it's always going to, so that's equilibrium. The rate of the forward and the backward process are going to be the same. Now, the pressure that I have on the molecules above, we haven't talked much about pressure, but normal atmospheric pressure is like one atmosphere. But the pressure uh, that I have above the liquid at equilibrium is called the vapor pressure, and the value of the vapor pressure depends on temperature. The more I heat something up, the bigger the vapor pressure gets to be. The boiling point occurs when the vapor pressure equals the pressure being exerted on the system. So if I take and set something on the stove and I'm going to boil it, the atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere, so when the vapor pressure of the water reaches one atmosphere, we say it's boiling. So all you're going to do is adjust the vapor pressure of your liquid until its vapor pressure matches that of the pressure that's exerted on it, and that's your boiling point. So you can see it depends then on what is my vapor pressure above it. My boiling point will depend on that. Typically, we talk about the water at 100 degrees C, and no normally things like this, what we talk about is we call that a normal boiling point. We use the word normal. And the normal boiling point is simply a temperature at which the vapor pressure, whatever liquid it is you're thinking about, is equal to one atmosphere. That's all it is. So there's a boiling point. It could have any value whatsoever. 
normal boiling point has one value, you know, it's the value, it's the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the material equals one atmosphere. Now, <clears throat> this one's a little bit busy, that slide's hard to see, I'm going to slide over and show you a bigger version of it in a minute. But the relationship between pressure and temperature is often summed up in a figure called a phase diagram. So along here is the pressure, and over here is the temperature that you've got. And so it's got all these goofy sorts of lines on it. But let's take a look at some points on this. We'll go to the next one because it's bigger and you can see it better. And what we're looking at here is, this is again pressure up here and temperature along here. So the line just represents for me, if I had anything at all, if somebody said to me, okay, I've got some, this is the water we have here. If I had something that's at 50 degrees C, and I had it at 101.3 uh, kilopascals of pressure units one atmosphere, so if I have water at 50 degrees, and at one atmosphere, he's right here along this line, and you can see he's in the liquid phase. So we know that water at 50 degrees is going to be liquid. He has a tiny little vapor pressure, but he's not in equilibrium with that vapor pressure at all. And so I can take any pair of points here. I can take any temperature and any pressure, find out where it is on this graph, and I can tell what state that's going to be, whether it's liquid, solid, or vapor. Now, what's helpful about a, a phase diagram is along these lines, this A to B, B to D, and B to C, is where we say these the system's in equilibrium. That means that, that the pressure, that, that the two phases at that point exist in equilibrium. Remember, that means the rate of the going to one phase equals the rate of going to the other phase. So if I take a look at water, if I had water that was at, let's say, this temperature here, like this, and I had this pressure here, like this, what that means for me is that I have liquid and vapor water in equilibrium. This would be the boiling point of water at whatever pressure this is over here. Okay, so these lines are equilibrium. When you're on that line, it means you have both phases, liquid and vapor. Or if you're on this line, you have solid and liquid. Or if you're on this line, you have vapor and solid at equilibrium. A couple of points that are interesting in here. One is B. Point B is called the triple point. Notice that the triple point, you have a line here. You have three lines intersecting there. What that's telling me is that at that temperature and at that pressure, and it's very specific, 0.01 degrees Celsius and 0.611 degrees uh, pressure kilopa uh, kilopascals, at that point, I have all three phases present in equilibrium, solid, liquid, and vapor. If I have them all sealed up in a container and they're not going anywhere, I'm always going to have three vapor, three va phases present at that point. It's called the triple point. It's used actually in setting the temperature scale. We use a triple point of water. It's 273.16 Kelvin, and once you, anybody anywhere can make up a system that has liquid, solid, and vapor in equilibrium, and they have that temperature and that pressure. There's no variability in that. The other one that's up here that's kind of interesting is D. It's called the critical point. The critical point, notice that the graph just stops here. You're coming off along here. If I'm coming up to higher temperature, higher temperature, higher temperature, I get up to here. All of a sudden, when I get to this temperature right here called at 374, it's called the critical point. It means that at this point, notice on down below here, I have vapor on this side, and I have liquid on this side. At this point, the line stops. That means I can't tell the difference between liquid and vapor anymore. They've become the same. One of the ways we say this sometimes is that the critical temperature is a temperature above which the gas phase can't exist. Now you can't have that phase exist up inside of there. And it actually has some practical uses. Well, let's take a look at the critical point a little bit. Most of it is interesting down here. This look at the picture. This is carbon dioxide. He's a known dry ice. He's a known good critical point guy. So when I start out at room temperature and I have liquid and I have gas up here, okay, and I start heating this thing up, what's going to happen is I keep heating it up. You notice here now that some of this stuff that was down in here in the liquid phase is actually showing up here in the gas phase, isn't it? But you can still see a line across here. As I keep heating it up, that line gets to be a little less and less prevalent and these colors start to match a little bit more and over here the line is even less obvious starting to match. If I get to high enough temperature, if I get above that critical point all of a sudden I just have one phase. I cannot have the two phases, I can only have one phase. You might think of it like this is liquid, water, uh, carbon dioxide is a liquid, has a much higher density than carbon dioxide as a gas. As I heat up the system then the density of my liquid is going to be going down and the density of my gas is going to be going up, and eventually they match, and it's the same material. 
supercritical materials are used commercially in several different types of things. So I give some examples up here, extracting caffeine from coffee beans. If you're one that likes your coffee decaffeinated, they probably use supercritical carbon dioxide to extract the caffeine from it. Uh, dry cleaning you can use it in. Uh, a degreaser, it's great at getting grease things off. The stuff dissolves in it very well. And you can extract a lot of solvents, um, sol use it as a solvent for extracting a large number of chemicals because it is such a good solvent. And then the last couple things, just want to look at a comparison of ionic and molecular compounds for just a moment, getting kind of ready for the next part. On the left, this is the ionic compound sodium chloride, which you'll notice in here, chloride ion, sodium ion, chloride ion, chloride ion, sodium ion, sodium ion. These guys have actually donated or picked up electrons, and there's just a stack of those ions. They aren't really connected one to the other. Okay? They have those plus and minus charge attractions but they don't have the bonds. They aren't sharing electrons at all inside of there. And over on the right hand side is water or a molecular compound and there's a um, it's a bad looking Mickey Mouse yellow ears on it. But if you look at the water, oxygen to hydrogens, over here these guys are kind of connected. Uh, the molecules themselves are bonded to each other and then each molecule is attracted to other molecules through some kind of a force that holds that structure together. Okay, so <clears throat> This different nature, uh, this leads to some property differences that are kind of important to us down the road. So we just want to plant that seed for you right now. Ionic, you have stacks of ions, covalent, you have molecules, you have bonded units together. If you look at some of the comparison of the properties of these, as you've got ionic compounds on the left, almost all of these are solids at room temperature, whereas for the molecular compounds, a lot of them are solids, but some are liquids, some can be gases. Um, Methane, natural gas, is an example of a molecular compound. It's a gas at room temperature. Uh, ionic compounds are very high boiling and have high melting points. It's very hard to separate those ions one from the other. We look back here, pretty strong charges holding these together. It's kind of hard to separate them at all. Molecular compounds have lower boiling and melting points. If you look at ionic compounds, it takes a lot of energy to melt them to separate those ions from each other, much lower over here to, for the molecular compounds. The other thing that's interesting is solutions of ionic compounds will conduct electricity, whereas solutions of molecular compounds will not. You've heard of electrolytes, probably this is what we're talking about when we talk about that. We'll see it more coming up. And most of, this, most of the ionic compounds are crystalline, hard, and very brittle. Table salt, things of that nature. The molecular compounds are going to be much softer than what the ionic compounds are. So that's your rundown on unit 21. And next one, we'll look a little bit about what some of these forces are between the different molecules.